Hello, I'm Tom Natchu. In this episode of Fraud Squad, we're going to meet Jeffrey Butler, a real character who established close personal relationships with his clients, guiding them into sound and secure investments for years. He became like family to his clients, gained their utmost confidence. But once the trap was set, Jeffrey Butler steered their trust and money right into his own business ventures and bank accounts. Little did they know, he was the most untrustworthy man they would ever meet. Mr. Butler was operating what I characterize and the jury found to be a Ponzi scheme. He had their money already under his control by the late 90s. He specifically targeted elderly, but he targeted elderly people that were in frail health. I look at my bank account, there was no more bank account. Mr. Butler raised over $12 million from uh, very senior citizens. And I uncovered another 113 to 120 victims that were investors in this case. Jeff Butler, the quintessential con man. He entered the lives of his victims by becoming close personal friends, visiting his clients on a regular basis and often bringing gifts. My father-in-law had inquired about a free living trust. He had seen an ad, I believe, in a, in a newspaper. And that's when he initially first met uh, Jeff Butler. The reason why he was creating these wills and trusts for free was to give him the ability to acquire the personal information of each of the investors. So he knew how much money they had. He knew where the money was. So it made it very easy for him, after building up this trust, to then go ahead and start moving that money from legitimate investments initially over into the fraudulent investment. Jeffrey, I think that you owe me some money. Last week's game? You don't forget a thing, do you, Joe? No, I don't. He befriended my dad, like he did everyone. And he did this by understanding what my dad liked. He liked to gamble. So Jeff, to get really close to my dad, would talk to him every single football game, every single baseball game, because my dad would love to bet 5 or $10 a game. I'll give you Miami on a five-point spread. I thought we were friends. He constantly did this and got closer, and he was able to talk to him very, very often. Come on in, Jeff. And he would come by on Thanksgiving and give him a turkey. He would just drop some steaks off periodically, and my dad just thought that that was over the top. Did you catch that game last night? Oh, I did, yeah. I think I won some money. Yes, for me? Yes, New York. New York. Oh, come on in. Clean trip, the way you like. My father-in-law had quite a bit of money in savings, and he was always interested in trying to, um, you know, make the best out of his money. So Jeff uh, encouraged him to make some investments. He then puts them into legitimate businesses, knowing that that's going to gain even more trust, and they were getting regular checks. Well, it's a new investment. It's a ground floor, so this is a really prime opportunity. The first time was 50, then I think it was 100, and then the final thing was another 100, and then he chased that 100 with another 100 at the end. Now, the first investment or types of investment that uh, he would sell to these senior citizens was an annuity, which is a relatively sound investment. It was then he then eventually moved him over into an illegitimate company, which became the, the Ponzi, and that was a company he owned and he operated. A senior citizen has a, a portfolio of nothing but bank CDs bearing 3 or 4%. He can get them an 8% return on a life insurance annuity and at the same time get a nice fat fee in return. And what the seniors didn't realize is that these annuities, you had to be in them for at least two years, where Butler was pulling them out at the one-year mark to get them into this medical capital investment where he again would realize a fat 10% finder's fee each time. There was a penalty associated with freeing up the funds from the insurance company, which the investors were never told about. Butler is receiving fat, juicy payouts each time. He was making upwards of 800,000 a year. And his whole modus was that they would die before he ever had to worry about paying anything out. Dad, can I see you for a second, please? He actually caused rifts between my father and I. Dad, listen, this guy I don't trust. Do not think 
invest your money with him. But I've already invested my You know that. Jeff knew you that I knew that something wasn't just absolutely perfect to get this kind of money when these interest rates weren't out there. I just knew something was wrong. So my dad, you know, knew that I really wasn't a fan of Jeff's. So we were talking this. So I don't want to overstep my bounds, but as your friend, your son really isn't an ideal person to be talking with about investments. I mean, what are some steps that should be taken before you give your money to an investment advisor? Ensure the advisor is registered with the appropriate government agency. Check to see if the investment advisor has any complaints registered against him or her. Check his professional credentials with a licensing organization or all of the above. Well, the answer is D. All these steps are helpful to determine if you're dealing with a reputable investment advisor. Jeff tried to influence my father-in-law in uh, not to listen to Kirk if Kirk gave him advice. He, you know, said that Kirk was not experienced in, in finances and in this area. You know, you shouldn't be listening to him. He's not going to be guiding you correctly. Jeff had got him to invest a couple hundred thousand dollars. Well, we're looking at probably... When your father doesn't believe you, when, when somebody has the ability to actually get into a family and 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 split a family apart by acting like they're the supreme person and, and they're the one that you should be trusting. Because I would see him come over and be a friend right to my dad's face and then take this money and do whatever he wanted with this money. He went specifically after senior citizens who were supposed to be in the golden years of their life, had saved for retirement for that specific purpose. And he turned around and stole every dime that they had and literally put them in poverty. Jeff was not calm as much. And then towards the end of the year, um, he got a letter in the mail from Jeff saying, unfortunately, uh, everything that they had worked on had been lost. My dad used to just sit there and shake when he would think about Jeff Butler. It, it, was, it was horrible. Shortly after, Keith's father passed away. Butler was able to successfully con over 120 retired individuals, but he underestimated one of his clients, 80-year-old Jose Ruano. I spent uh, weekends and many, many nights uh, writing uh, letters and looking into the internet for anyone that could help me. We invested in, a, in an annuity plan, invested quite a bit of money in there. Uh, about $256,000 altogether. I would land in Korea seven days after the war got started over there for nine months. Uh, left there in 1951. Eventually, the Vietnam War broke out, and uh, they volunteered my service over there. I had four tours of, in Vietnam. He has commendations and recommendations. He took the money that he got while he was in the war zone, and he took that money and set it aside, never spent a penny of it and he put it into savings so that he would have them for his retirement years. And now he gets to his retirement years, he invests with Jeffrey Butler, and everything he worked for is now gone. After a couple of years, he then changed the investment, offering to his investors an investment in a company that he created called Global Network Providers Grenada. And I found out that the company was involved in communications building a, uh, a cellular telephone system uh, network. About 130 clients were already in another investment that he had going for them. He merely transferred their investment to this one under the premise of it's safe and secure, you'll still receive your same rate of return. Uh, much of the money was used uh, for his own personal uh, uses. It included uh, several cars, very nice house in the San Juan Capistrano area, and uh, basically just living a very high lifestyle. He uh, provided us with the newly written promissory notes. When I read the uh, promissory notes from Global Network, I read and they were identical to the promissory notes from the MCC company. And I became very suspicious 
And in September of 2003, Mr. Butler started to uh, send out notices to his investors saying that he needed a delay in payment on their investments because of problems that were going on in Grenada. He continued to send these letters periodically until 2005, when ultimately he said, your investment is lost. <laughs> I received a call from Mr. Butler, and I brought out the, uh, to him the fact that I wanted to uh, seek uh, legal advice. And he just laughed at me. He said, so what? So he's an attorney, so what? Well, I, I need help. I need money right now, Mr. Butler. I said, I'm pleading with you. I'm actually pleading for my own money. I said, my dad is dying. Get a visit in. So he said, oh, Absolutely. Just, I can't Absolutely. help that. No. But he wouldn't no, give me any money. So it was like a financial homicide because now they don't have any money to live off of. The range of dollar losses uh, to the victims was as low as about $12,000 and as high as uh, $700,000. But that's not a fair characterization of the harm and injury that was created by Mr. Butler. The gentleman who invested only $12,000 is a man named John Haug. I had a small pension. I invested everything I had saved. I Mr. Haug today is probably 102 years old. At the time that he testified uh, for a conditional exam, he was 99 years old. He was pretty much living hand to mouth. That $12,000 represented his total life savings. The financial ruin that he caused is insurmountable. This wasn't, oh, by the way, I made a mistake. He deliberately targeted these people. At one time, because of the shame that I felt, I felt that I thought about committing suicide. True or false, Charles Ponzi was the very first person to commit a Ponzi investment scheme. The answer is false. Although Charles Ponzi is credited with inventing the scheme and is one of the most well-known fraudsters ever, historians tell us that this type of fraud dates back hundreds of years. If it had not been for Jose Burano, I firmly believe that Jeffrey Butler would still be doing what he was doing right now and nobody would ever be the wiser as to what happened. This, is, uh, 2005. this case was brought to our attention as the result of uh, one particular investor. His name was Jose Ruano. After I talked to him and he laughed at me, I was very bitter. I had gathered a number of documents from the FCC, the ECC, uh, many governmental agencies. Uh, and I have checked into this guy. I also had him investigated. It cost me uh, a lot of money to have him investigated. Mr. Ruano is, uh, in my opinion, a, uh, an, an amazing individual with an incredible amount of tenacity. While he couldn't say specifically how it was fraud, he believed it was fraud. I spent uh, weekends and many, many nights uh, writing uh, letters and looking into the internet for anyone that could help me. I contacted the district attorney office in Orange County, and Mr. Fraser was very, very instrumental in helping me. I arrived at Jose's house. No, thank you for that. And he yourself. took me over to the kitchen table where he had already had all the documents laid out in perfect little stapled paper clipped order. Mr. So. Fraser came here about two or three times and uh, made a recording over, took several notes. He called me many, many times. So at that point in the investigation, I have a pretty clear image in my mind that Jeff is targeting senior citizens. I put all my life The first time I went to Jeff Butler's house was in March of 05, and I met him on the driveway as he was coming out to pick up his morning paper. And I introduced myself. I told him that I was an investigator from the DA's office, and that I was here to ask him some questions about some people calling me saying that they thought that they might have been wrong. Jeff Butler took me into his house and I asked him a bunch of questions about this uh, investment opportunity that he had called Global Network Providers and then we just retraced uh, the previous uh, investments that he had with this group of investors of senior citizens. Uh, what I was saying is um, you're, you said you're an advisor or uh, 
You were the guy in charge, you principal, advisor? Well, I'd be the primary investment advisor in the company, yeah. Okay. Uh, in my facade of being a dumbed down investigator was I wanted Jeff to admit to me that he was the principal of these investment ventures. I, I needed that from him. This, this company thing, um, there, there's like, um, there's higher ups and there's, and, and then there's you, or is it the other way around? Like you're, what's your role? Well, it's my company, I'm the uh, principal. You're the owner of the company? Of the company, yeah. Okay. So the second time I went out there, I went with a group of investigators. He wasn't there to greet me this time, so I had a knock on the door. Peggy, his wife, was the one that came down. She wanted to know why I was there, and I had to tell her I was there for a search warrant. I had a, she would demanded proof of it, so I gave her a copy, and then she reluctantly led us into the house. Investigators went up, brought uh, Jeff down from his bedroom as we searched the rest of the house. His wife was hysterical. She called me every name in the book. She was upset, she was crying, she had mood swings from high up to very low. He had all of the global network provider files, he had all of the living trust, he had all the investment material in his third garage in a vertical file cabinet. So we took everything that was pertaining to any one of our 115 victims at the time. So it, it came out to be 500,000 documents. It took me about a year to put this case together. I believe we had a little under 900 charges that we charged them with. Bernard Madoff committed one of the largest Ponzi frauds ever. What year is Madoff scheduled to be released from prison? Is it 2025, 2139, 2050, or 2183? Well, the answer is B, 2139. According to the U.S. Federal Bureau of Prisons, Bernie Madoff's scheduled release date is November 14th, 2139. Everybody got a trust fund. What kind of a sentence do you think Mr. Butler should get? As we started to prosecute this case, we were dealing with a situation where many of the investors had already passed away. One of the things that the DA did, which was very smart, was he interviewed the victims that were still living, and he got them on tape so they could play it in court because they knew, because of the frail health of many of his victims, which most of them were, that a lot of them were not going to be alive by the time the trial ended. When I watched that video for an hour of these people testifying of, of how they lost their money, my heart, my heart just broke. I, tears were running down my eyes when an 84-year-old man said that he had to take a paper route. I showed up at Jeff's house. I knocked on the door. Nobody answered. Finally, Peggy Butler answered the door. Seeing me again just put a spark of anger into her, and she proceeded to curse at me, and I said, I'm coming in anyway, so let us in. Uh, so we were able to get inside the house, and it's a very large house, so we break up and we go about clearing the house with the other investigators. We handcuffed him, and then we took him downstairs to a sheriff's unit that was waiting for us since they had the caged back door. And we placed him into the car, and then the sheriffs, the Orange County sheriffs, took him to Men's Central Jail here in Santa Ana. When we appear in court the first time, uh, after the judge entered the chambers there to the, the court, he asked me if I could identify Mr. Butler, and I immediately point him out with my index finger. I didn't hesitate to point him out. His defense was that he was as much a victim as anyone else. He believed that uh, the investment in global network providers, as well as the other investments, would result in uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and income. While Mr. Butler may have had the ability to make a choice, an intelligent choice, whether to get involved in an investment such as that, these victims were never given a choice. This was a nine month long trial. He was found guilty on 690 counts. As it stands right now, Mr. Butler will have to serve at least one half of that 90 year sentence, meaning that he has to serve at least 45 years. Mr. Butler essentially received a life sentence 
and it means that if he gets out, he'll be placed in the same position as his investors who lost their life savings. In the Butler case, there was 127 victims. And what happened in this case is, is that almost to everyone, literally is now penniless. He stole every dime they had that they had saved for their retirement years. Their golden years became a nightmare. When you look at work all your lifetime, you have no, no opportunity to gain that money again, to make that money again, never again. Right now, I have a box, a cardboard box, with receipts of checks, promissory notes, they are worthless. That's uh, all my mistakes. Despite of all the troubles I had, she always stood by me. Always very faithful, always next to me. When I fell very much in the dumps, she was always there to help me, give me a, a helping hand. And uh, I would never be able to find a wife like that if I live a thousand years. <laughs> Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Fraud Squad. Remember, we're fighting fraud together.